Good morning. morning. It is good to see you. It's good to be vertical. It's good to be a lot of things today. (laughs) And I'm thankful for for, for all of that. Uh, We're very excited to uh, welcome the Reverend Dr. Gerald Liu as our preacher today. Uh, His sermon is not the lure of Christian vocation, however. That is his lectures this week. Uh, his, His sermon title for the day is The Challenge of Fearless Faith. And if you don't get afraid, he'll bring on his giant Great Dane that he has with him. So uh, warn you about that right off, right off the bat. Uh, some announcements that we need to uh, be aware of. Uh, all youth of Bayview and their friends are invited to come to the last beach night of the season tonight, 6 p.m. at the rec, rain or shine. Come down for some games and snacks and time together and devotions and discussion time. So you're invited to take advantage of that. Uh, Another announcement is that to please join the Women's Council for its annual carry-out lunch, or carry-in lunch, rather, and installation of officers and directors on Tuesday, uh, August 6th at noon. Please bring a salad or dessert to pass and uh, your own choice setting. This will be their final regular meeting of the season. Uh, Are there any other announcements that we need to make at this time? Handbell concert is when? Thursday the 18th. All right, handbell concert. That's always a good event. Any other announcements that we need to make? Okay. All right. Then I would invite you to rise for the uh, call to worship. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. One generation shall praise your works to another. All your works praise you, Lord. They make known the glory of your kingdom. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord.
And would you join me, please, in the prayer of confession? Lord, you said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Lord, you said, you may ask for anything in my name. Lord, you said, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Lord, you said, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Lord, you said, you must testify, for you have been with me. Lord, you said, love each other as I have loved you. Amen. Beloved in Christ, hear the good news. Come now. Let us argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, I invite forward Lucas Solgit, who is going to be our poll bearer. Lucas, where are you? There you are. Thank you, sir. And children, follow him. Good morning. How are you today? Are you sleepy? A little bit? Yeah, I get that. Me too. It's a sleepy kind of a day. This morning I want to talk to you about the kinds of things that we use for protection. So do any of you play baseball? Softball, yeah. So what kinds of things, when you go to play that game, do you need to have? Yeah, hold on one second. 
helmet. And why do you need the helmet? So then if you get hit in the head, it won't maybe, I don't know. Right. So if you get hit in the head, right, to protect your head. What else do we need when we're playing baseball or another sport? Pad. What kind of pad? Knee pad. Knee, pa knee pads, and I guess that must protect your knees, right? Do you have any other sports you play where you have protective equipment or you know of it? Yes? Yes? There's wrestling that you need headgear to protect your ears so you don't get an ear infection or anything. So you don't get an ear infection? I'm thinking it might be somebody might grab your ear, right? Right? And that would certainly be, that would make you lie down, wouldn't it? Today when you go to Children's Church, you're going to be having a lesson about a certain kind of protection that we call upon as people of faith. And we call it the armor of God. The armor of God. Have you ever heard of the armor of God? Let's ask them. Have you ever heard of the armor of God? They have. As people of faith, we put on the armor of God when we need protection, when we need to be strengthened, when we need help in knowing what's right and what's wrong, when we need to know that God is with us in a challenging situation. What, you got to look at me for a minute. What kind of challenging situations do you sometimes experience? What can be kind of hard for you? Anybody feel like they're willing to share the things that might be a little bit hard in the world? You guys are golden, huh? Sweet. Should we ask them? Let's ask them. What kinds of situations can be hard? Getting out of bed. Getting out of bed. <laughs> so Pastor Dan said that it's funny, but the reality is he hurt himself, he fell, and he's injured. So getting out of bed for him is a real thing. Anything else? Help me now. Losing a loved one. Amen. Seeing friends suffer. Losing a pet, a beloved pet. Thank you. Say again. Feeling insulted, right? Do you ever have anybody say things to you that just don't feel good? Have you ever had that? Sometimes. Sometimes. So one of the things that we do when we are in situations like that is we put on the armor of God, right? So let's just put it on for a minute. Will you do that? Go like this. Put on the armor of God. Everybody. Everybody. Put on the armor of God. Amen. You just put it on, right? You cover yourself with God. And covering yourself with God, you are just protected from things that might come at you that don't feel good, things that might hurt your feelings, things that might be hard, all right? Today, when you go to your lesson, you're going to be learning about that, all right? Let's be in prayer together. I want to pray for you first, and then we'll pray the Lord's Prayer. Gracious and loving God, we, we put on the armor of God ourselves, but we cover these young ones in that armor as they go out into the world, and we we just want them to know that you are with them, Lord, in every day, in every hour, in every moment of their lives. Help them to remember that. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Have a wonderful time at Children's Church. Thank you, Lucas.
Good morning. The Lord be with you. My name is Gerald Liu, and I'm really delighted to be here with you this morning. Before I read the scripture, I'm just going to say a few words of thanks and some introductory remarks, and then we'll get into it. I want to start by thanking Reverend Dan and uh, Laura, who picked me up at almost midnight last night. We, we left at 1.30 uh, in New York, and I think got to bed at 1.30. Laura's from Texas, as you know, and Joel Osteen was in Yankee Stadium a couple days ago, and you got Gerald Liu here. <laughs> um, also, here serving in worship today, I, I just want to thank Hillary and, and Lucas, um, Riza and Kenneth and Everett and Peggy and Patty, anyone who I may have missed. I really appreciate all those who made worship possible this morning. I want to give thanks to God for all the Bayview speakers and preachers as well. Um, I'm just a part of those cloud of witnesses. And I want to bring you greetings again, as I just mentioned, from New York. I serve as a minister in residence at the Church of the Village. It's a church in downtown Manhattan, in Greenwich Village. I also bring you greetings from GBHEM. It's one of those bad, or maybe good, Methodist acronyms for the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry. And let me just explain a little bit about what we do because it touches uh, upon the good work here in Michigan. So the ministry wing of GBHEM assists with multiple dimensions related to the training and empowering of ordained, licensed, chaplaincy, and lay ministry. And the higher education wing of GBHEM supports our United Methodist affiliated schools, colleges, and universities that number just north of 100. Adrian College and Albion College are the two United Methodist Colleges in the state of Michigan. And GBHEM also supports United Methodist faculty, staff, students, and campus ministers across institutions of higher education and learning around the country and around the world. Eight campus ministries here in Michigan represent the broadness of that network, and they are Central Michigan University, United Campus Christian Fellowship in Grand Rapids, University of Michigan, Motor City Ministry, Ferris State University, Kalamazoo Wesley, Michigan State University, and Northern Michigan University. Can we just give a hand for all those campus ministries? I mean, it is truly, truly amazing. The, the Methodist campus ministry that's happening right here. And if I missed anyone, I apologize. Please come and uh, correct me after we're done, or just come and say hello. And in the meantime, again, may God bless all the campus ministries and all the ministries here in the state of Michigan. It's good to be with you here this Sunday again, and also to resource uh, the Methodist Annual Conference here, my daily work. Will you pray with me? Grant to us, Lord, we pray, the Spirit to think and do always the things that are right, that we who cannot exist without you may by you be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please hear a reading from Luke 12, verses 32 to 34. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. The word of God for the people of God. This is my first time in the lower peninsula of Michigan. I remember one of the first times I ever visited Michigan. It must have been the late 90s when I was in college at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. Anybody from WashU? Go Bears. All right, somebody. Um, A good friend of mine, Ben Looker, he teaches American Studies at St. Louis University. He was from Michigan. And I think it must have been an Easter break, he invited me to uh, visit his home in Ann Arbor. And from Ben, I learned about using uh, your palm as a state map of Michigan. He also introduced me to one of the most magical Reuben sandwiches I've ever had at Zingerman's Deli. (laughs) Have you been to Zingerman's? I think Zingerman's used to lead destination trips to places like Turkey to look at pepper or something like this. Anyway, it was amazing to a boy who grew up in Mississippi. We played pool in a faculty pool hall at the University of Michigan. In fact, I went back to Ann Arbor uh, just a few years ago to preside at Ben's wedding, and they put me up at a hotel called Weber's, which is near, yeah, so Weber's has got this great indoor heated pool But what stunned me most about Michigan that first time, that first time, was the lake culture. And Ben and I even made a jaunt out to a lake. I can't remember exactly which one with a few friends of his. And I was awestruck by the kind of carefree lifestyle and also the natural beauty of Michigan. I had initially thought of Michigan as kind of a cold, industrial place in the Midwest with football not quite as good as the SEC. (laughs) But the basketball's okay. But wow, Michigan's got lake culture. And Bayview is another Michigan lake wonder. In Luke 12, Jesus tells the crowd that it is God's good pleasure to give them the kingdom. And we get a sense of how those words still ring true in the wonder of travel and natural beauty of a home state like Michigan. Seeing a new place or being at a place like Bayview rinses our minds so that we can witness God's good pleasure. We catch a glimpse of God's kingdom, or basileia, the actual Greek word here in the New Testament. And what Jesus told the crowd nearly 2,000 years ago still rings true today. But the world is also a crazy place. It seems to be getting weirder and weirder and too often scarier and scarier. Hometown summer activities like Fourth of July parades become sites where the innocent are slaughtered. Fresh water can also end up flooding homes, drowning the innocent, ruining the lives of those who survive. When I graduated from seminary in 2004, you're going to have to bear with me, I'm going to talk about myself. Uh, I lived in a basement apartment in Atlanta. I left for a few days early in the fall to uh, participate and go play music in my oldest brother's wedding. That was in Indianapolis. And while I was there, I received a call on the phone. I was working at the church, uh, a church, excuse me, in Tucker, Georgia at the time, and the lead pastor called and he said, Gerald, are you sitting down? And I thought, yes, why? He said, There was chest-high water in your apartment. 
Hurricane Jean, which was the worst hurricane at that time since 98, had struck Florida and it sent torrential rains all the way up to Georgia. And my apartment just looked like a CNN disaster zone. My laptop looked like a chocolate cake. Uh, the flood wall had fallen on my bike. It was completely mangled. When I got back to Georgia, the pastor, in, in, God bless him, uh, in their garage had all these papers strewn out, weighted down with fans blowing on them. My degree, my MDiv from Candler, is still uh, water-stained. The beauty of the earth given to us by God can also wreak havoc in our lives. And during my first pastoral appointment, uh, when I was a minister in England, I traveled with a girlfriend to Egypt and a boardwalk where we dined the night before in a place called Dahab. It's this kind of seaside town. It was bombed the night we left. And that bombing actually made the news on CNN. That was 2006. When I finished my PhD and I was teaching in Boston at 20, in 2013, I uh, ghost ran, you can't really do this anymore, the last 10K of the Boston Marathon with a friend, he was running for a charity and we crossed the finish line and then we went up to a kind of hotel hospitality suite sponsored by the charity. Our view of the finish was a little bit blocked by the li library in another building and we heard kaboom, kaboom. I thought it was a transformer no one knew what was going on. I tried to uh, make calls on my phone. All the cell phone uh, reception was cut out, and eventually we learned what had taken place, the Boston bombings of the marathon. And I could go on to tell stories about the mayhem in New York, where I live now. I'm sure that you have stories, too. You don't need to hear them from me. We don't have to read them in the headlines to get a sense of how remote, how far away the Basileia or kingdom of God can seem. We know it feels far from us when we recall just bad luck in addition to real bad tragedies in our lives. And yet Luke reminds us that in this world, in this world, here at Bayview, here in Michigan, in the real world, as devastating as life can be, it still remains true that it's God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. It still remains true. And we should not fear, according to Luke, But being fearless because God takes pleasure in giving us the kingdom takes work. The next verse in Luke has Jesus telling the crowds to sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. Nowhere else in the Gospels does Jesus give the advice to sell all possessions and give to the poor. Matthew 6 has a verse similar to the treasure in heaven part, but only Luke presents such hard direction from Jesus. And the trouble is, verses like those from Luke 12, they aren't hard to interpret. Unfortunately, they mean just what they say. They're easy to understand. They are so hard, perhaps impossible to do. The Methodist-founded Victorian beauty of Bayview and its Chautauqua values of worship, the performing arts, recreation, and education provide only a glimpse of the Basileia of God. The fuller picture in Luke 12 requires accepting what seems counter to beauty and flourishing, selling what we have and giving to those in need. 
I know what you're thinking. Gerald, we're on vacation. <laughs> Why couldn't the lectionary just given us be fruitful and multiply instead? <laughs> Even a few pages later in Luke 16, 11, a dishonest manager is commended for faithfulness with dishonest wealth. But here... In Luke 12, 32 to 34, the guidance is much more astringent and straightforward. Sell what we have and give to the poor. I think it's fair to say that all of us here have a decent amount of stuff. I live in downtown Manhattan, Greenwich Village, to be precise. I think, however, this pulpit stage area is bigger than my apartment (laughs) but I used to have an office when I was an academic Uh, now I work from home remotely and that means storing 35 plus bankers boxes worth of books and miscellaneous items from my previous office that I pay north of a couple of hundred dollars a month to store I could have bought it all back by now. I need to get rid of it. Uh, But I've been holding on to these boxes just in case, just in case an office magically appears again. Just in case I move to that penthouse in the sky. Uh, The point is, I'm not living into Luke 12. I am not dispossessing like Jesus urged in those verses that the crowds ought to do. I'm trying to keep everything I can. And we probably won't put a price tag on everything in the near future so that we can have some cash for those who have nothing. So the challenge of fearless faith in Luke is likely to be one we'll struggle with our entire lives. So what do we do? What do we do? Now, because I know education is one of the values here at Baby, I'm going to turn it up a notch a a little uh, with the pseudo-intellectualism of my sermon. But have you heard of something called the Protestant ethic. About the time that Bayview became a Chautauqua, a German ethicist named Max Weber wrote an essay called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. And that essay was inspired also by a visit that Weber paid to America in 1904. I'm going to oversimplify his thesis, but it goes something like this. For Weber, Protestantism, and especially Reformed and Calvinist versions of it, where election is key for salvation from God, that kind of Protestantism, when mixed dangerously with the rationality of capitalism, creates a world where Our freedom depends on work. Our freedom depends upon work, rather than work expressing freedom. Our freedom depends upon work, rather than work expressing freedom. What does this have to do with Protestantism again? In other words, for Weber, we're enslaved to work. And although he builds his thesis from Calvinism, it works for those of us who are Methodists too. In other words, we know we're free when we have professional and financial control over our lives. For him, we're free when we have professional and financial control over our lives when we can visit Bayview whenever we want, when we can build a place like Bayview or have a cottage at Bayview, when we can shield ourselves from the craziness of the world at Bayview, 
How do we know we're chosen or elected by God? By what we possess. By what I have. What I own displays how blessed I am. I must have been a real holy theological educator because look at all these boxes of books. If this sounds like prosperity gospel to you, like health and wealth equals holiness, Weber's Protestant ethic is a root of that kind of theology. It's just more subtle. It's more pliable. How do I know I'm blessed? I have succeeded. And I have stuff to display in terms of material and human things. For example, I have a warm and noble home. Maybe I have more than one home. I have a respectable job. Better yet, I retired from a respectable job. Even better, a lucrative job. Even better, I retired young from a respectable and lucrative job. I'm married. I have a child. I have grandchildren. I have more than one child. I have a pet. I have more than one child and pet. I am a dignified citizen. I have purses that always run full. Now, to be clear, Weber was not anti-success. He wasn't anti-family. He wasn't anti-being a good citizen. He himself married Marianne Schnitger, a feminist activist, and that brought him financial independence so that he could write things like the essay I'm talking about. But he worried about how an infatuation with bourgeois values could distort our view of the world. It could end up making us care only about what was ours, indifferent to the pain and struggle of others, and even indifferent, ironically, to the God to whom we attribute our success. Because actually our blessing just relies upon how hard we work and how much stuff we have. That's not grace. That's the Protestant ethic. In short, the Protestant ethic was a cage to use Weber's language again. It's a cage because equating success defined by our own achievements, morals, and rationality, and especially defined by the logic of capitalism mixed dangerously with Protestantism, distorts the gospel. It distorts the gospel. The land, water, and people Bayview celebrates are what God gives lavishly. But when we put a price on the land, water, and the people, and attribute status upon them in exclusive and exploitative ways, we distort the freedom, gifts, and basileia of God. We increase anxiety and fear about, for example, whether we can afford it, whether we belong and fixate upon exhibiting that we can afford it and that indeed we do belong. Instead of living fearlessly into what God has provided, everything. God has provided everything that we already need abundantly. So how do we love God and ourselves fearlessly? And given what we've been given by God, how will we invest in the kingdom of God? How will we put treasure where our heart should be? Jesus in Luke is not advising us to give it all up and become monks and nuns, missionaries, pastors, chaplains, campus ministers. But if God is calling you to do those types of ministry alongside what we've heard from Luke today, please don't ignore that call. And I know some of us have already followed those kind of callings. 
But maybe the verses in Luke could get us to thinking about how to address the impossibility of fulfilling them with practical steps forward. Steps such as maybe we invite the people we try to escape to Bayview. Maybe we send folks whom we try to avoid to Bayview. Maybe I don't exercise a tax credit to buy an electric vehicle. Maybe I find ways to provide rides to those who need it with the car I already have. Maybe I don't wait until housing pops to buy another home or rates to come down to get a spot here at Bayview. Maybe I find a way instead to help first-time home buyers afford property in our perpetual housing crisis and in a beautiful place like this. Maybe I actually house the disenfranchised in my own home. Maybe I consider adopting children as well as pets. Maybe I dignify all people, including those without cars, without homes, without children, without pets. How do we sell and give like Jesus wants, especially not only to the impoverished and disadvantaged, but also to our enemies, the violent, the hateful, maybe even those whom we despise? So in short, your pastor can't be your only poor friend. Uh, there are no easy answers to this question or line of questioning, but we have to realize, we have to realize that we're blessed by what we give, not by what we have. We can start by taking steps, and not just individually. We can experiment with selling what we have and giving to those in need together. Maybe Bayview could become a gathering place for thinking about creative ways to live into Luke 12 and accepting the challenge of fearless faith. And if we fail, that's okay. It's God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, no matter what. For where our treasure is, there our hearts will be also. Amen.
hands clear and still above the storms of passion, the murmurs of self will now speak to reassure me. by Gerald's words about where true worth comes from. And Gerald, we extend our hand to you in blessing and in love and pray that God will continue to bless your work and your preaching and your life. In Jesus' holy name. Yeah. Amen. As we Turn now to God in prayer. I would ask you to take a deep breath. Breathe in God's peace. And let it touch the restless places deep within. And breathe in God's love. And let it touch the places that maybe aren't feeling very lovable today. Call to mind what you would pray for today. The joys and the concerns that you've already shared in our prayer request box. But the things that are on your heart, things maybe you haven't shared with many people yet. The joys, the concerns, the persons, whatever it is, gather them up with me now. Remembering that where two or three are gathered together in the Lord's name, there is the Lord in the midst of them. And let us pray. Holy God, show us what we can give. 
show us that we are not doing this all by ourselves. Show us that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses and by friends and family and that together help us to make a difference. Lord, for the persons that are hurting today in need of your healing touch, we ask your blessing upon them. For those who mourn the loss of loved ones or other things in their life, may they find comfort and hope. For those who have lost their way, may they see a path. Gracious God, pour out your healing and Holy Spirit upon us all, upon the requests that have been made today. And we thank you for the incredible gifts that we've received already. Be with us, bless us, and hear our prayers as we pause to pray in the silence. As we prepare to receive our offerings, we're reminded that all that we have comes from God and that what we give is but a portion in return. And let us worship God now with our offerings. Sanctify us, sanctify us. 
Holy One, receive these offerings as tokens of our lives, rededicated to your service. In Christ's name, amen. Beloved by God, take comfort, find joy, and be encouraged that it is God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. And may Christ inspire and empower us to beautiful and bountiful benevolence. Go in peace to serve and love the Lord. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.